Hello, and welcome to the Encore webinar event, HIPAA Compliant Faxing in a BYOD World. Thank you for taking time out to join us today. I'm Carol Farr with High Tech Answer, and I'll be moderating the Q&A for today's webinar. Before I introduce our presenters, please note you can pose a question using the question widget found on the dashboard. I'd now I'd like to introduce our presenters. Michael Flavin is the Senior Product Marketing Manager at J2 Cloud Services, Inc., and is responsible for the go-to-market strategies for the EFAX corporate suite of solutions. Brad Spanbauer is the Director of Product Development at J2 Cloud Services, Inc., and is responsible for the EFAX corporate suite of services. Gentlemen, welcome back for an encore presentation. We're excited to have you here again. Thank you, Carol. We're excited to be here. Our agenda for today's webinar will look at industry trends, BYOD and healthcare, HIPAA concerns with BYOD including common misconceptions, BYOD best practices for protecting EPHI, faxing in healthcare today, compliant mobile faxing with eFax corporate and eFax secure suite of products, and we'll end today's webinar with Q&A. So Brad, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you and I'll see you back in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Carol. And as you might expect, the information provided in this presentation does not constitute and is no substitute for legal or other professional advice. We strongly encourage you to consult your own legal or professional advisors for individualized guidance regarding the application of the law to your particular situations and in connection with any compliance-related concerns. And with that, here's Michael to talk about BYOD in healthcare. So the business case for BYOD, or Bring Your Own Devices, in healthcare has been made, and the upside has been great for the industry. Uh, research from the American Bar Association, for example, shows that most physicians and healthcare staff utilize personal uh, devices, or BYOD devices, and applications, uh, which has resulted in improved overall care for patients. And... Uh, with that demand, now patients are starting to demand some of the real-time access that these uh, applications on the patient side can uh, enable and provide, such as making appointments with your physician, getting test results in a secure manner, uh, downloading personal health records, or other communications that are confidential in nature with your uh, primary care physician, uh, for example. Covered entities are also seeing improved efficiency and accuracy, and this is another factor contributing to improved overall patient care. Uh, in fact, according to research from Health Management Technology, uh, about 60% of physicians uh, surveyed um, <clears throat> reference that uh, they avoid adverse uh, drug interactions by using these devices. For example, um, checking two medications against each other um, could, could uh, prevent an adverse prescription from being rip, written for someone who's already on an existing medication. Uh, and also, uh, about 50% of uh, physicians mentioned that in the survey that they can save up to 20 minutes a day, uh, which is significant uh, for a primary care physician, and that's a chance to see about two more patients. Um, so that's good for the practice, and it's, and it's good for the patients, and it's good for um, improved health care. But BYOD carries some real risk uh, for healthcare providers. Um, this shift from, from BYOD uh, has happened over time, and as hospitals have transitioned from workstations and mobile carts to, uh, say, Apple devices, iPods, iPads, um, Android devices, it's created a bit of a, a security concern for uh, IT professionals and a bit of a headache because now they have to manage all of these devices and understand who can get access to what. And now they have to understand how do we protect uh, EPHI, how do we stay compliant with HIPAA and high tech. And also, how do they manage the known risk of breaches? <clears throat> For example, lost devices, uh, a device left at, say, a coffee shop. Uh, if an employee uses uh, an iPad to do a text about protected health information about a particular patient while they're using public Wi-Fi, um, is that uh, a reportable event? Is that unauthorized? Um, how 
do health IT uh, staff manage and prevent unauthorized access, say, by a rogue employee internally of an organization uh, to protected health information for which they do not have access or do not have authorization to access in the first place? So while the demand of applications is, is being met by ID departments, um, and there's thousands and thousands of applications out there, um, security in many ways is still a question mark. It's still lagging somewhat um, for many uh, health IT um, management and thought leadership. For example, the increase in BYOD and associated applications has resulted in a spike of, spike of uh, HIPAA violations. MD News re, uh, recently reported that about 40% of violations involve lost or stolen mobile devices, these BYOD devices um, that may be left at a coffee shop or uh, they may be stolen um, or perhaps even compromised by a, a cyber thief targeting the EPHI so that they can commit cyber theft and then resell that um, EPHI on the black market and uh, commit cyber fraud. These devices were not likely pr protected or encrypted um, or protected by passwords or screen locks or, or all of the above. And so it's a big issue affecting the industry. So while most covered entities and health firms let their staff use uh, BYOD or uh, personal devices, um, there's not a high level of confidence that they are secure. So while 88% of those surveyed enable BYOD programs, um, not a lot of them have a high um, confidence that that information is secure. In fact, fewer than half of these firms, according to Security Week, um, have programs that give them a high level of confidence. And this may be due to several factors. Uh, there may be a lack of security or centrally managed BYOD uh, applications or service deployed uh, for that healthcare entity. Um, some of them cite lack of inventory controls. Uh, for example, who can access which applications and which BYOD uh, devices have next, uh, network access in the first place to uh, protected health information. And simple things like password uh, protection or encryption of uh, PHI or EPHI that is on uh, devices may be not even implemented. To furthermore complicate this trend, um, there's been an explosion in the applications, as I mentioned earlier, in the healthcare market, um, such as the prescription interactions, um, there's Medscape, there's ePrescribe, all scripts, um, secure faxing uh, through eFax and other uh, applications is out there. Chat and instant messaging uh, are applications that are commonly used by healthcare staff and care providers. Um, there is over 100,000 healthcare applications on the market today. Apple has a large share of these. Um, there's over 43,000 in the Apple Store alone, uh, followed by Android. And this market is continuing to grow to support the demand of the healthcare industry, um, which is, is really booming. Uh, this market will be probably about is estimated to be about $26 billion uh, on the service provider side by 2017, according to health IT outcomes. So for health IT management, staying on top of all of the applications, all of the users, all the different platforms is a really tall order. And uh, that's the challenge today. So BYOD has really created a myriad of, of new issues for IT management vis-a-vis -vis HIPAA. Um, some of the issues uh, that, that they have to address today are, you know, with so many operating systems and applications, how to cover entities, IT staff, uh, and thought leadership, you know, how do they manage security centrally um, so that they know what data is going in and out of their network? Uh, what about use of devices that's outside of their network, public Wi-Fi, coffee houses, remote employees? It's a... Um, a lot of new issues to deal with. Um, and of course, you know, what if a, a device is lost or stolen? How do they deal with that? Was there EPHI on that device? Uh, if, a, if a device is jailbroken, which is um, basically when someone um, 
tricks the app or breaks it so that they can download unauthorized applications. Those could pose huge risk and open uh, a door, if you will, to, to EPHI and a network's database, for example. Um, how do they know if, if someone that's terminated or a rogue employee accesses EPHI uh, improperly uh, viewing information that they're not authorized to view? These are all real issues that are very hard for, for IT staff to um, keep up with. So what does HIPAA say and what do the uh, HIPAA privacy and security rules state? Well, in general, uh, HIPAA states that covered entities must implement the reasonable safeguards uh, to limit incidental or prohibited uses and discloses of PHI and or EPHI, so electronic or paper form of um, personal or uh, protected health information. Um, so the onus is really on the entity to, to do this, but the HIPAA privacy and security rule um, with respect to BYOD really doesn't give a specific definition of solutions or what is secure or compliant for those devices. There's no mention of BYOD or personal devices such as iPads and iPhones, uh, Androids, or, e or even applications for that matter uh, in the 2003 Act. I mean, it was written before many of these in 2003, before many of these um, devices or applications even existed. Uh, and there's no real specific solution identified by uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. So, therefore, the onus is really on covered entities to implement reasonable security measures uh, safe and safeguards to protect electronic protected health information, or PHI. Uh, but what specific rules can apply to BYOD and healthcare apps? Well, again, HIPAA doesn't specify a type of encryption. Uh, however, it is a best practice to encrypt EPHI at rest and in motion. The safeguard rule references uh, a mechanism, but doesn't say which one, and, and perhaps that was by design by the architects who built this law, so that uh, each entity can decide which solution would be best for them if they deemed that uh, their data within their network could be at risk, which in many cases, if it's not encrypted, probably would be. Um, so certainly something like TLS encryption uh, would, would be an enhanced uh, a, a way to send uh, encrypted data over a network or when faxing or um, sending information. And uh, with EPHI, um, things such as IM or uh, test results to a patient should be encrypted as well. And that, that data, if it is at rest, um, sh has an encryption um, standard but not a specific solution. The um, HIPAA security rule further specifies that data that is sent over an electronic network um, should be encrypted. And uh, it is, again, up to the covered entity to implement the technical security measures to guard against unauthorized access. And um, while there's not a specific level or type of solution, it is a best practice to protect EPHI um, through encryption. For example, AES 256-bit encryption is a NIST-supported standard for data at rest and is a very strong uh, encryption uh, methodology. So the bottom line um, for covered entities is that while there is not a specific standard uh, enumerated um, by HIPAA security and privacy rules, certainly um, some components of the security rule can be applied to covered entities that store and transmit protected health information. So let's talk about um, four of those. Uh, the first one is, is access control, and that's really uh, implementing the technical policies and procedures to maintain EPHI. Who can get access and through what applications. And examples of, of access control uh, could be strong passwords, um, they could be screensaver timeouts, it could be multi-factor authentication, it could be a strong password uh, 
uh, expiration policy, say every 30 or 60 days, passwords expire, and then managing those who don't need access anymore, say an employee who moves on to a new job, a termination, or unfortunately maybe there's a, a rogue employee. So that's access control, um, CFR 164.308. Uh, and then transmission security. So uh, another component of um, the privacy and security rules. Transmission security uh, basically lays out that a covered entity should implement the technical and security measures to guard against unauthorized access of EPHI over an electronic network. So the encryption uh, referenced earlier um, is really important here. It doesn't, uh, the standard doesn't tell us what we have to use, but that a good best practice, such as using TLS encryption for um, encryption of, of, uh, and transport of protected health information over a public network, uh, would be a great practice. Um, use of uh, access, rather, of, of uh, protected health information through a public network or remote employees would be another uh, great opportunity to, to implement um, strong transmission security standards. And then um, next would be data encryption. So um, where reasonable and appropriate, as defined by the um, privacy and security rules, covered entities should implement a mechanism to decrypt, uh, encrypt and decrypt EPHI. Um, and the, the rule stipulates that any data that is in REST, um, it would be a best practice to uh, render that EPHI unusable by would-be hackers. So let's say that um, you know, uh, someone left their phone at a, at a coffee house or uh, at an airport or someone got access to a, a device that wasn't password protected. If there was PHI on that device and it was encrypted, it would have stopped that um, hacker right there unless they had, you know, the credentials to, to get into that. But if it's encrypted, um, that, that's a big defense layer. Um, and again, encrypting using a standard such as AES 256-bit encryption um, that is um, supported by NIST, the National Institute of um, Standards and Technologies, um, would be a great place um, to start. And then finally, audit control, um, which is really procedural mechanisms for a covered entity uh, to record and examine activity. So what's going on on the network? Um, which systems contain EPHI, who is accessed, what data, and when. These are the things that um, you need to know to manage, uh, let's say, a breach and to stop it dead in its tracks or to understand who did what and to what extent a system may have been breached, but also to understand internally to have the mechanisms and controls in place to manage um, your employee base. Uh, are they accessing the data that they should or should not be? These are things that um, must be understood. And then, uh, you know, lastly, what data has left the network and to whom was it disclosed? Was it deleted, altered, or destroyed? These are all um, parts of the audit control rule. Um, so any application that uh, covered entity use needs to have this capability um, so that you can uh, maintain compliance and have reporting on uh, applications and who is accessing uh, what data. So earlier we talked about the lack of specific um, language in the HIPAA security rule and the, and the privacy rule uh, about BYOD specific devices. And because of this, it's, it's led to some common misconceptions um, that could put your organization or employees at risk of reportable events or data breach. Um, so we wanted to uh, cover um, those common misconceptions with you just so, uh, you know, just in case you're, you, you may have already addressed these in your privacy and security policy, but um, maybe there's some new ones for you to take away. So um, one of the common ones we see is that uh, leading medical applications that people have um, are quote unquote HIPAA compliant and so that organization thinks therefore because they are using um, application service provider X 
or data backup service Y, which says on all of its marketing material um, that they're HIPAA compliant, therefore we are HIPAA compliant. Well, just because apps uh, that you use or a service provider you use uh, is compliant, it doesn't mean that they're, they're being used in a compliant manner, and it doesn't mean that that business associate is necessarily um, HIPAA compliant. Uh, just because they state that they are. So, for example, if an employee uses, um, again, you know, the Wi-Fi at an airport is a good one, or public area, uh, and they don't have uh, security uh, protocols enabled on their device, uh, the, the, there's no password protection, and they leave it somewhere, um, that could be an exposure of EPHI um, and a reportable event. So you have the most HIPAA compliant um, say, device in the world doesn't mean that an employee or someone can't mistakenly misuse that or uh, nefariously use that to look at something that, you know, protected health information that they don't have access to. Um, and then uh, misconception number two, so if a, um, an employee leaves uh, a device at a coffee house um, or if they uh, knowingly and willingly do something wrong, um, the covered entity is not liable. It's the employee's fault. And so, therefore, um, you know, they would be held liable for that, but not the, the, the care provider or the clearinghouse. Well, that's not true. Um, under uh, HIPAA and high tech, uh, an employee's actions can cause your organization to be fined, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Uh, an example, um, Recently, uh, a large pharmacy had an employee who nefariously accessed uh, information to, let's just say, someone that used to be part of the family, and um, they were caught. And while the employee said that they did it willingly and the employer argued that they should not be liable because of the law today, um, that covered entity was uh, enjoined into that lawsuit and became part of a big settlement. Um, and it's a pharmacy a lot of, of us have, have heard of. So um, just because someone does something um, silly or, or nefarious or whatever it is, um, doesn't doesn't waive the um, um, liability of the covered entity. The third uh, misconception that we see is that um, because there's passworded protection in place for these BYOD devices or laptops, we're HIPAA compliant. Well, as we talked about earlier, password protection is 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 one piece. It's it's great to have in place, um, but it's one piece of an entire BYOD approach. So. Uh, for example, if the screen lock was not enforced, um, the password protected device is useless. So uh, someone <clears throat> could get to that uh, device if it were left on a table or, or in a break room, um, they could access that network. And so if the EPHI on that device wasn't encrypted, um, that would have been exposed. So again, a covered entity has to implement the reasonable measures and mechanisms to protect EPHI. So the answer is yes, it, it should have been password protected and encrypted, um, notwithstanding other, uh, other security measures that could be uh, thrown in with this. And then the fourth uh, common misconception that we see is that, well, we have policies and procedures in place, even on mobile devices, and, and that puts us in compliance with HIPAA. Well, um, having <clears throat> an overall HIPAA uh, policy, procedures, proper uh, administrative, physical, technical, and organizational safeguards in place as required by HIPAA are a great start. But employee training is also a key uh, component here so that employees understand the rules and that they are enforced so that they know, you know, if they break a rule, there, there will be, um, you know, consequences. So for instance, instance, uh, an employee that uh, works at a front desk uh, at, at a uh, primary care facility uh, turns their screen so that someone they're helping can see, um, say, medical results or some other uh, protected health information, maybe social security numbers or blood types, whatever that is, and then someone um, behind that person um, could view that data. Well, that would be a HIPAA violation. And so, 
you know, understanding the policies, but then executing on those policies so that everyone makes common sense decisions is really an, an important part. And the human element is, is really an important part of the training so that everybody understands. Uh, there should be no assumptions made about the rules and, and what's uh, uh, really considered um, a data breach or an exposure of PHI and what's not. And then finally, uh, misconception number five, um, we're compliant for sure because our vendor that handles our data storages has signed a BAA with our company. Well, it's great to have the BAA in place, but again, you know, just like working with any business associate, if they say they're compliant, doesn't necessarily mean that um, they've implemented operationally the controls and measures that we talked about. It doesn't mean that you're compliant either, and it does not shift your liability to any third-party vendor. It is a shared liability. So it's even more important to fully vet any vendor or application service provider that pur purports itself uh, to be HIPAA compliant. Uh, a BAAA is required, but like policies and procedures, um, that does not equal security or a security plan. So along with uh, some of the misconceptions we've, we've talked about, um, uh, Health IT Security came out with a, a top 10 list, so kudos to them for uh, publishing this list of, of BYOD best practices for protecting EPHI. So I'm going to go through um, some of these um, so that uh, you or your organization can consider them. And um, then uh, we'll move on to mobile device management, which is very specific to um, BYOD uh, and mobile device management with applications. So BYOD best practice number one is really the, the um, blocking and tackling, the basic component. You want to have clear, concise, and comprehensive policies uh, regarding EPHI and disseminate these uh, company-wide. And, and it's, a, it's recommended as a best practice to train your employees um, semi-annually so that um, they are refreshed and uh, understand any changes. There may be new employees. There may have been mistakes made. Um, where corrective action was needed, and you don't want to make those mistakes again or risk further fines. So that would be uh, a great start. And then <clears throat> the second one, uh, BYOD best practice number two, would be to create a list of, of your inventory, basically, and make it dynamic. So uh, what that means is what are all of the devices that can access your network, whether it's Wi-Fi or directly or remotely, uh, and understand, you know, all of those applications that are deployed so you can really get a holistic view of what's um, enabled and what should be turned off. Uh, maybe a device, for example, is compromised, uh, jailbroken. Uh, maybe uh, an, a, a person is no longer with the company, um, so you would want to obviously immediately, um, you know, manage that access. Or there's a rogue employee, for example. BYOD best practice number three. So make sure that um, all data at rest and in transit is, is encrypted. This is a best practice, and it's a way to keep the, any PHI that is on those devices safe. Again, part of a overall BYOD uh, policy that would include password protection before you can even get to the data. BYOD best practice number four, um, install a uh, regularly update your antivirus, your anti-malware, and your device protection. Um, central management is key to this so that um, whenever updates or patches um, or anything needs to be pushed out to these devices, uh, they may be device rules or anything like that, um, you can do it at one time and centrally um, manage that process rather than going to each uh, device. It's just inefficient to do it <clears throat> device by device. And then number number five on our list is a training and compliant use of apps. So uh, again, the, the personal component of training each individual, making sure that they understand um, what is compliant and what is, uh, you know, at risk use or something that would be a reportable event. Don't assume employees will do or know the right thing. Um, Kevin Mitnick, a famous uh, and reformed uh, hacker who now uh, who, who works for the FBI, um, said that he would rather 
uh, try and trick someone than hack into a system. It's easier to, to trick people. And so that's why it's so important to um, make sure everyone understands what compliance use is. BYOD best practice number six, encrypt data to make sure that it's useless to hackers if they, they break in. So always make sure that you use the highest encryptions level possible and make that data worthless to would-be cyber hackers. Best practice number seven, um, demand that your staff implement password protection for all mobile devices. And it's also important that, um, that a timeout is included with that because the password protection is only good if, if there's a screen lock. So um, there's, there's areas where convenience uh, kind of overtakes um, the security component where people will, can, can turn that off. So you want to manage that and make sure that it cannot you know, be disabled or that they are complying with what your policy is. Maybe it's one minute, maybe it's five minutes, but um, that's up to your organization to implement. And then, um, BYOD best practice um, number eight, deploy intrusion detection and prevention technology. So this is next generation technologies that are available to companies such as uh, firewalls, um, intrusion detection, and tr intrusion prevention. And it's basically a way for an organization to tag that metadata that is of um, extremely sensitive nature and help also help um, you know cover entities understanding if that data is leaving the network that they can triage you know and understand and have alarms and notifications going off if say uh, data is leaving to someone who it's not supposed to be uh, accessed by. Then best practice number nine: implement biometrics or other multi-factor authentication. So um, anything from fingerprint readers. Um, there are remote, uh, there's remote access software that has a second level of authentication. So it could be a four digit PIN plus something else that only that person would know. And it just adds another layer of protection. And then finally, uh, BYOD best practice number 10 for protecting EPHI, utilize MDM, which is mobile device management technologies. Uh, these technologies can help um, a covered entity centrally manage all of their uh, devices, update the software, the applications, the permissions, um, and then deploy all of the applications to whomever needs access or revoke that um, if someone is terminated or access is terminated um, or if there's uh, an investigation going on, for example. And it, and it also has remote wipe capabilities. So in case of, as we've talked about during the webinar, a lost or stolen device, or maybe something's jailbroken, or there's suspicion that something is going on, um, that data can be wiped remotely um, by IT staff. So it is um, a tool that's, that's very important to help manage this if something goes wrong. So, there's a lot of uh, mobile device management solutions out there, or MDM uh, solutions, uh, offering robust uh, bring your own device protection and tracking and remote wipe capability. Simply put, um, this is a, a um, security tool and device management tool that IT can use to manage their entire uh, mobile device ecosystem. And it really uh, can greatly enhance your ability to remain HIPAA compliant. And then um, these devices, as far as what they can support, um, here's some best practices. Uh, they can allow you, again, to centrally manage all of your devices, passwords, um, data loss prevention, and uh, separate you know, employees' personal information from protected healthcare information or other apps. Uh, and it's, it's also great for organizations because it allows them to manage uh, productivity um, with IT control and security that, that they need um, to provision and manage all of these uh, devices. So now that we've uh, talked about some trends in the industry with BYOD and the explosive growth of applications, um, some of the mis 
conceptions that are out there about compliance and using these devices, uh, a couple of the horror stories and the best practices. We're going to shift now to um, a technology that can be used as part of a HIPAA compliant program, um, which is mobile faxing. And um, Brad Spanbauer is going to work with us to go through several use cases on how your organization can implement mobile BYOD HIPAA compliant faxing. Brad, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, in our latest Healthcare IT Pulse survey, we found that faxing is still a major communications protocol in healthcare, and 61% of healthcare firms cite faxing as one of the top two approaches to exchanging critical information. And 42% of healthcare providers believe online faxing is the most effective communication technology for HIPAA compliance. And with that, I agree. And lastly, 37% cite faxing technology as the most undervalued protocol when it comes to security and supporting their business needs. With that, let's take a look at a few mobile use cases. So remember, uh, however you fax, whether it be from a fax machine, an MFD, or a mobile device, you are still responsible for managing your documents and maintaining compliance. That is key. Michael talked about that earlier. So let's take a look at these uh, a few uh, use cases here, uh, you could be a, a medical staff sending uh, faxing authorization to a pharmacy. You could be an insurance company faxing approval for surgery, uh, both of those HIPAA compliant. Or you could be a physician uh, faxing an image or a document from a mobile device to an insurance company. And that can also be HIPAA compliant. These are use cases that we uh, live and breathe and see every day. So when would that mobile come into play? Uh, so today you have a number of options for faxing from your mobile device. Uh, you can do this securely with an app that supports encryption in transit. Uh, many mobile apps do. Our uh, fax mobile app does. Uh, you can send a fax via email. Very common practice uh, for most of our clients. Uh, you can do that uh, standard email or uh, using enhanced security uh, with an option uh, such as enabling a TLS connection. Uh, and remember, um, for those of you who might not be familiar with TLS, uh, TLS 1.2 is the preferred encryption method now over uh, SSL, which although much more uh, commonly spoken about, uh, really is uh, uh, out of date and just not nearly as secure. Uh, so uh, if you're going to send uh, an encrypted email, uh, use TLS. Uh, also, uh, another uh, case would be if you needed uh, added security for storing your faxes. Um, uh, you can send a, uh, uh, an encrypted fax, uh, but if you want to uh, make sure that you're maintaining compliance, if you're going to store that, you need to make sure that it's encrypted at rest. So uh, using a service like eFax Secure uh, is key. So as Michael mentioned earlier here, uh, the key point to remember uh, when you're uh, faxing, whether it be via mobile device or other, uh, uh, if you're trying to maintain compliance, you are responsible for maintaining that compliance. If you securely send a fax and then leave a printed copy sitting on your desk, you could be out of compliance. If you're sending a fax from your, no your mobile device, uh, and whether that's an image or a document that you've downloaded, once you send that fax, you need to make sure you delete it from the device uh, if you don't have uh, a, a completely secure device. Uh, the point is uh, keeping your employees and your compliance training up to date uh, is just as important as the service that you use. So, so uh, Brad, just the, the common sense approach to things like I alluded to earlier um, is, is what you're honing in on there so that people don't, uh, you know, turn a screen with PHI on it so that everybody's sitting, standing behind that person in line, for example, or leaving PHI uh, on an unencrypted device. Those are the things you're, you're honing in on. That, that, that is exactly right. And again, uh, uh, with a focus on mobile, uh, you're carrying that device around with you. Uh, you need to be uh, extra cautious and always uh, uh, making sure that you're not uh, leaving it on the counter at the, at the mall or um, uh, leaving it where somebody else can get access to it if it's not secure. Great. Great. Uh, so uh, what are a few things that you should be looking for uh, if you're trying to find a faxing partner? Uh, well, number one would be somebody who will sign a BAA or a business associate agreement. You want somebody who's going to partner with you uh, in, that, uh, in, in helping maintain your compliance. 
Uh, you need a service uh, that provides detailed reporting and tracking, uh, especially uh, around uh, uh, audit and uh, compliance. If you're going to get audited, you need to uh, have uh, records that support your business. Uh, you need a service with strong encryption, whether that be at rest or in motion. Uh, again, I'll give my eFax corporate pitch. Uh, we offer uh, uh, encryption uh, anywhere you need it. Uh, you need a service with a redundant data center and disaster recovery. Uh, that is key. Uh, your data matters. And uh, Michael can talk a little bit more about the eFax corporate data centers. Well, thank you, Brad, um, for those use cases. Those are, are very real world, and um, um, we are uh, partnering with some very large uh, uh, healthcare providers and um, uh, information exchanges these days to, to help them accomplish that goal, and clearing houses as well. Um, so another key differentiator Brad touched on uh, is our infrastructure. Um, you know, eFax Corporate that's our core business, and uh, we, we have a invested significant um, um, financial capital in uh, uh, building out a geographically dispersed global network with Tier 3 and Tier 4 co-locations. These co-locations maintain um, either SOC 2 or SSAE uh, certification, so it's, it's very, very serious security. And, uh, you know, when you look for a partner, you, you want that. You want that peace of mind in knowing that, um, you know, uh, our success is tantamount to the security of, of your data. And eFax Corporate takes that very seriously. Um, we also provide, uh, with this redundancy, high uptimes and uh, failover. We have 99.5% uh, uptime and very rapid delivery times. Also, Brad talked about the, the uh, security component of this, you know, the data at rest and in motion. We offer, uh, we have solutions that, that it can enable TLS encryption and uh, secure uh, storage, AES 256-bit encryption. These are NIST um, best practice standards for encryption. Um, so you know when you partner with EFAX Corporate, uh, not only will we uh, talk the talk, we'll, we'll walk the walk. We'll sign a BAA and we have the infrastructure and security uh, and policies and procedures to support it as well. So a little bit about uh, EFAX Corporate and, uh, and J2 Global. So uh, EFAX Corporate is part of J2 Global Incorporated, which is a publicly traded corporation. Um, we have specialization in cloud applications and help businesses uh, be more productive. Uh, we're headquartered in Hollywood, California, where it is a beautiful, warm, and, and actually hot afternoon um, here in Southern California. And uh, we're an enterprise company with, uh, as I mentioned, the, the significant infrastructure and scale to support many of the Fortune 500 companies worldwide. Um, and we also have uh, very significant uh, intellectual property uh, around uh, cloud services. Well, thanks, Brad. Thanks, Michael, for that presentation. And we've left a little time for Q&A, and I've got some questions from the audience. If we don't get to your questions today, please uh, feel free to reach out to EFAC directly, but I'm sure someone from EFAC corporate will be getting back to you to answer your questions directly. So Brad, Michael, are you, are you ready to take a few questions from our audience? You bet. Ready to go, Carol. Thank yeah. you. Uh, great, great. <laughs> so uh, Daniel's uh, question is on um, BYOD. If you access an encrypted and password-protected work internet email and open an attachment in the email, it downloads to the BYOD and now is stored on the device in a downloads folder. Pretty pretty common, common practice. Is that a HIPAA violation or does the eFax secure feature you talked about make us compliant? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and with, of course, without a uh, truly simple answer, uh, it depends on uh, what you do with that device. If there's a, uh, is it password protected? How long do you leave the data on the device? Uh, so it really depends. EFAC Secure uh, can be part of a compliant solution, but using any solution doesn't automatically mean you're compliant. So if you uh, do download a document, uh, even if it's secured in transit when you download it, you need to make sure that you handle it as EPHI once it's on the device. So if it's something that you're looking at or something that you're going to fax off from a device, uh, if it's not encrypted on that device, you need to delete it once you send it. Uh, you should make sure that that device is password protected and that other people don't have access to it. So 
not really a straightforward answer, but uh, still accurate, and that is it all depends on how you're handling that data. And I, I would just add one other thing, Brad, to that on um, some of the MDM features that are out there. So an IT manager or uh, a private practice manager, um, they, they could leverage the mobile wipe capability, let's say, if something does get lost or if a consultant has uh, a mobile device and they leave it at a restaurant, they can wipe that data. So just one more layer of protection in case because life happens and, you know, you don't want to be exposed if, if you know, an accident like that happens. Okay. Um, Justin's question is, what functionality is built into the mobile apps, built into the mobile app satisfies HIPAA requirements? If someone on a staff sends a fax from a PC and not mobile, would that be non-compliant? Operation. Yes, uh, good question. So, well, first of all, going back to what we talked about in the webinar, um, anything sent over a public network should be encrypted. Um, going back to the documents and or data at rest and in motion. Um, so right there, EFAC Secure uh, meets that requirement. And also specifically, you may recall during the webinar, we, we talked a little bit about um, specific uh, requirements uh, HIPAA talks about access control, transmission security, data encryption, and audit control. Uh, as required by HIPAA, EFAC Secure can meet that requirement as well. But as Brad alluded to, this is one component of, of a BYOD program. So all of these pieces can work together, but you know, leaving a uh, non-password protected uh, iPad uh, somewhere or exposing that to someone waiting in, in line um, is a HIPAA violation. So just because you, you have a solution doesn't necessarily mean you're uh, using it in a HIPAA compliant way. I hope that helps. That's a long, long answer, yeah. but loaded right. question. Yeah. And I'll just add, Justin did ask if uh, using the mobile, what, what in the mobile app uh, satisfies uh, HIPAA requirements, and that is uh, it is encrypted in transit, so if you're sending via the eFax mobile app, uh, that is compliant when it's in transit. So. Uh, another another app question from uh, Juanita. Do you charge for the EFAC Secure mobile app if our organization gets EFAC Secure, or does it come with the account? Uh, the app is free. It's uh, it's a value add with the service itself. Uh, and I would just remind you that again, it's always up to you and your organization to make sure you use it in a compliant manner. Uh, Rhonda, do do we have to encrypt data on BYOD devices? What if we delete PHA once a month? <laughs> right, Rhonda. Uh, thanks. Good question. Um, so as we talked about in the webinar, the, the, the HIPAA security rule and the, and the privacy rules, uh, they don't really give you a specific solution. Um, but it does state clearly that covered entities have to implement those reasonable safeguards we talked about to limit, um, you know, prohibited uses or um, unintended disclosures of, of PHI or EPHI. So, again, encryption at rest and in motion, um, as far as data moving or being stored, um, you, you know, you, you want to put those measures in place, your organization or your IT management, so that uh, you won't be like one of these organizations, you know, in the news where they didn't put the right measures in place and, uh, unfortunately, their, you know, patients' um, data got exposed. Mm -hmm. uh, Samit, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, has a question. Are all FACs HIPAA, HIPAA compliant because FACs is more secure in general? Uh, thanks for the question, Sumit. So, I mean, there's several components to the law we discussed today. Um, but remember, the recryption requirements, requirements that we discussed, the data at rest and emotion, um, is that one uh, component. There's a perception out there that, that facts is secure and faxes by themselves are harder to decipher or decrypt. But um, the, the law is pretty very specific about anything going over a public network. So that's number one. And also, if you're leveraging, um, you know, a CloudFax provider or you're, you know, you have a CloudFax server on site, um, just because you work with a particular vendor and they sign a BAA doesn't mean you're in compliance necessarily, um, as well. So uh, that's another another key consideration. For example, there's HIPAA compliant faxing, uh, which we've done um, another uh, a webinar on. And there's also the conduit exception to faxing where data is just simply passed through. So those are a couple key questions you might ask your vendor um, when working with them. 
Back to another app question. Uh, Dana's question is: Do your mobile apps work with Apple iPhones too, or just iPads? How do we and how do we turn on the secure feature for HIPAA? Uh, well, uh, yes, they work on iPhones as well as iPads. Uh, in fact, we have uh, more people who use it on phones than on tablets, uh, since phones seem to be more prevalent. Everybody has one in their pocket. Uh, the secure they feature. Do. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, the security we enable as part of your particular configuration, so um, we can have somebody from uh, our uh, sales team reach out to you to discuss uh, how that gets enabled. Uh, so, uh, we do a lot of faxing from MFDs. Do you have a HIPAA compliance feature for them as well? Well, that's a, a great question. So, MFDs, in case anybody doesn't know what that is, multifunction device, or also known as multifunction printers, it's that big uh, connected printer, copier, scanner you might have in your office. Uh, you can uh, absolutely be compliant faxing from that. Uh, the place where people get in trouble, believe it or not, is uh, if you have a, uh, a secure account hooked up to that uh, printer and then go and scan some documents that you want to fax off to another provider perhaps. Uh, if you walk away from the printer and leave your documents on the glass or in the collator there, uh, you're uh, not in compliance anymore. You've left uh, some PHI sitting out on the copier. So uh, the, the the connectivity itself can be compliant, but it's that human factor where you might trip up. So uh, keep that in mind if you're uh, when when you're doing training around compliance. Mm -hmm. We're winding down here, so I've got time for one last question, and I'm going to take Bill's question, which is: Can each user get a HIPAA compliant account slash fax, or is there one fax number per account? Oh, uh, you can get. Uh, we can set up an account with one fax number or with twenty thousand. Uh, it just depends on uh, what your particular needs are. So uh, they can all be HIPAA compliant. Uh, you know, one number, multiple numbers. It's uh, up to your specific needs. Yeah. And we are just about out of time. And I want to thank our audience for attending today. If we didn't get to your questions, no worries. Somebody from EFAX Corporate will reach out to you. We capture that information. And obviously, you can call them on their U.S. number, their U.K. number. And please visit them online at enterprise.efax.com to learn more about their suite of products. Michael, Brad, thanks so much for your time today. I look forward to our, our next event. Thank, thank you, you so much, Carol. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.